Tak. Uh, the reason why we're speaking in English, just to let everyone know, is that Cherie is English. So we'll be doing the first half of the session in English. Uh, and then Cherie has to leave because she's Irish. Irish, sorry, not English. <laughs> Irish, she has to leave because it's in Texas. It's all of you know. Um, so, uh, just to let you know, language wise, I thought it was a good piece of information to start off with. And thank you very much for coming. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to see you with so many people. As, uh, as, as Thomas just, uh, just mentioned, I think uh, it's safe to say that the people in this room are going to be front runners in this area because uh, this, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the debate about inclusive marketing is still something when I talk to people in marketing, a lot of people either don't see the need for it, or they don't really understand it yet. That's, uh, that's what we are here to change. Uh, and that's also why I, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to see that so many of you here. Um, the magazine where I'm the editor-in-chief, Marcus Ferg, you will find it on some of the chairs, all the chairs. Um, we actually did, uh, in December, uh, a whole issue which uh, was focused on describing trends and tendencies that everyone in marketing has to understand. And I have to admit, when we started off the research for that issue, I had no idea that it would end up looking as it did. Uh, I thought we would be writing about uh, new technologies, uh, AI, uh, maybe something about work-life balance, maybe something about new, uh, new methods, new competences, but actually, as you all uh, see, on the, on the grey front page, we ended up having diversity on the front page. Uh, because when we took all these tendencies, we have 17 in all, we said, okay, these are the 17 most important things that you have to understand uh, in marketing in 2022. <coughs> diversity and its role in marketing was the most important one. Um, and you'll, uh, you'll learn why during the next couple of hours, and I'm, uh, I'm so delighted to see Cherie here, see Pierre and Nadal, and they will each share their perspectives on, on this issue. Cherie was also one of the sources in the story, so once you leave, if you forget some of what was said, uh, read the magazine and maybe, uh, maybe you'll find new insights there as well. Um, I'll just check if there's something I've forgotten to say. Well, I, uh, I don't think there is so much more to say. I would like to ask you though, this is just out of curiosity, how many of you in this room are working in a structured way with diversity and inclusion where you work today? How many of you are working with it today? What do you mean by structure? Uh, well, well, I think uh, if it is somehow hinged in a strategy or in a, in a practice in the company, so it's not, not just something that someone's uh, driving themselves, that's probably what I mean by structure. Let's see, yeah. I'd say about a quarter of the room. Um, interesting. I, I, I still think you're front runners. I think the, uh, the percentage is lower in the general, uh, in the general business. But uh, that's very interesting to know. And I would be very curious to hear. Please uh, tag along in the break uh, if, if you have experiences. And I also want to say in a few minutes, Shiree will give her presentation and then we'll have about 15 minutes for debate and questions for her. Feel free to ask your questions uh, during that time. I really hope we can get some uh, dialogue going because uh, I think that's the most important thing if we are to, uh, to move anything in this, in this area. And with those words, I think I'd, uh, I'd like to welcome you, Shiri Atchison, Irish, uh, and uh, VP for Diversity and Inclusion in Baltic. And uh, I, I, I feel like it's safe to say one of the uh, international pioneers in this area. Someone that I'm quite sure we can all learn a lot from. And I think I'll, I'll give the floor to you, Shereen. Um, and then also some statistics that maybe you'll find useful to take back with you. 
I would think that everybody here is interested in this, so probably I'm going to be preaching to the converted. But maybe when you go back, maybe it's not so easy. So take some of this knowledge back with you. I'm also going to talk about some meaningful ways to create inclusive marketing that I think have really worked. But I guess a bit about me first. I am listed as one of the UK's most influential women in technology and a multi-award winning leader for diversity and inclusion across the world. I'm a published author on diversity and inclusion and my book Demanding More, Why Diversity and Inclusion Don't Happen and What You Can Do About It was one of the Financial Times best books of the summer last year, which is very exciting. My work is really, really rooted in unearthing privilege through data. I used to be a software engineer, so I take a really technical analysis of how to change the problem that I think many of you will understand and know. To do that, I share a lot about what I do. So I write a lot for Forbes, for Thomson Reuters, and all of those kinds of publications. If you're interested in hearing even more from me, you can find them all online. I'm in the Group VP of Diversity and Inclusion at Baltech. Now, Baltech is a global digital transformation agency. We create new experiences for clients and people alike. Our work is in 19 countries and over 50 cities. But our role is really transforming by doing. We listen to people, we find out what they need or what they don't know that they need yet, and we create something that answers to that problem. Now, we are all over the world. My work spans all of those 19 countries, and with that, we get a real nuance for what diversity and inclusion means, both separately and together, across all of those regions. I've held senior leadership roles at lots of companies like Deloitte, Pecod, which was founded in Copenhagen, uh, Monzo Bank, and now at Valtech. In all of those roles, it's been through over all different cultures, different kinds of people, different needs, different everything. And with that, what I think is really important to recognize is the nuance. Think about yourself, think about the people that you work with every single day, how different you all are, regardless of whether you identify with the same label as Danish, for example, or Irish, for example. I actually can't believe you introduced me as English as we just spoke. <laughs> but anyway, I won't hold it against you. I might. Um, but we really work on diversity and inclusion in a really structured way, which I know you were touching on at the start. We have a very clear three-year strategy across five important pillars, which is accountability, hiring, inclusivity, community, and education. Now, we've shared that strategy externally, so if you're actually interested in seeing what that means outside of those five words, you can find that on our website, you can find out all of our data and so on, and we're starting to branch into sustainability as well, because that's so closely linked with inclusion. But I actually think it's important, before we talk about how to make things better, to talk about why diversity and inclusion matter. Now, I personally think it's important to separate the two things. Very, very often, when I'm helping organizations with strategies or people are interested in making it better, we start from this point of, this problem is really bad. This isn't good enough. I want to make it better. But we don't spend the time understanding all of the people decisions that have been made to bring us to this point, the history, the reasons as to why actually are we in this position that we see huge disparities in the tech industry, banking industry, marketing, media, and so on. And when I think when we talk about why does diversity and inclusion matter, firstly I'd like you to think actually why does it matter to you personally, but also why does it matter to you as a business, as an organization. Now, what I want you to think about that before you even come to a conclusion is to think about exclusion. To think about the people that are ultimately left out or continue to be left out. For example, we know that the attrition rates for women in technology are 41% globally versus 17% for men. We know in the US, only one out of five companies offer paid family leave for lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender employees. Globally, when we understand socioeconomic background, your financial background, your parents' background, for example, that students from higher socioeconomic backgrounds do better at every single stage of the interview process than those from poor backgrounds. And those from poor backgrounds statistically drop out disproportionately higher 
a live video stage interview than any of those other groups. Now I want you to just take a wee second, just a small one, because I know we're on time, <laughs> about what that means. Think about this in the context of the global pandemic that I know certainly Denmark's doing really well with this, um, but actually what it, the impact of that exclusion means. When we look at the studies of unemployment rates that have came out recently from, for example, North America and the UK, we see that disabled people have suffered disproportionately, again, when it comes to unemployment rates. We also see that those specifically affected with redundancy rounds in America, for example, are black and Latin women, and in the UK, it is black and Pakistani women. Then you look at the cross-section of that from that class background, and this is what I want you to think about this. I want you to think about this more than just one, zero, black, white, man, woman, all of these different labels that come together and create a very different society for some versus others. Now, when we think of this in the context of business, in marketing, in the people you reach, I'm going to talk in more detail in a moment about why that's important. But actually, we're all very privileged here to have the opportunity to create something that reaches other people. And what I think is important about that is also recognizing that when you hear those statistics, is it good enough that we live in a world that so greatly advantages some, but disadvantages others? And the answer to that is no. I hope the answer to that is no. <laughs> Otherwise, you may be in the wrong room. <laughs> But there's also a business case here, and I always think it's important to talk about that. And these are the kinds of statistics that I always think help when you bring them back with you to people that maybe don't get it, that maybe want to understand actually the why behind a business really tapping into this. One of the things for us at Valtech, where we're now around 4,500 people and will be scaling quite fast, is that we know we work with so many different clients. We work with so many different people. How could we truly service those people if we don't embrace diversity and foster inclusion with the people that are coming into the business, that we want to come in, and also that we want to stay? We want them to stay. That's a really key part here. But the statistics don't lie, and there's been lots of really great research done on this. The first one by Deloitte um, shows that when employees think their organization is committed to and supportive of diversity, Innovation revenue increases by 83%. Now, innovation revenue is how we measure ideas that are created from inception and taken all the way to execution. Now, think about the companies that you're in, whether they're tech companies, whether they're marketing companies, whether they're the combination of all of those things. Ultimately, you're trying to create something new. Whether that's you're trying to amend something that exists and make it better, or break it down and start all over again but you're trying to innovate. Every single business is trying to innovate in some ways, shape, or form. Again, by Deloitte, an inclusive organization is two times as likely to exceed financial targets, three times as likely to be higher performing, six times more likely to be agile and innovative, and eight times more likely to achieve better business outcomes. And then from McKinsey, we see that companies in the top quartile for gender diversity are 15% more likely to outperform their competitors, and those for ethnic diversity, 35%. Now, I want you to take a second to actually think about why that is. You know, stats are great, but actually, how do those things come to life? And the reason for that is that we have one problem, solution, one idea, with all of these different perspectives bouncing off of it. We avoid making decisions in echo chambers. We put friction into our processes before we decide to go in left or right, up or down, whatever direction that that might be. When people ask me what my job is, the most basic way to describe it is I stop people making decisions fast. I put people and I put friction into all decision making processes because that's my job. My job is to get people to stop making decisions like that with the snap of a finger because your brain short circuits, it takes quick stereotypes, it uses assumptions, and assumptions are riddled with bias. But in these scenarios, we're slowing down enough to allow that friction to create new ideas. We're embracing that friction as opposed to not paying attention to it. And what we're really doing in these scenarios is we're really properly listening to things that are different to our own perspectives. And I'll give you an example um, of when we talk about creating and listening to different people. 
Think about how you listen to someone when they're speaking to you. If they're telling you something new, either you know about it or you're interested in it, have you already came up with the answer that you want to give before they've finished speaking? So really you're waiting for your chance to speak, your turn to voice your concerns, or are you listening to what they say, taking a few seconds to digest that, and then responding? Now think about the very different experience that is when that happens. Now I'm sure we've all been on either end where you're either, you know, you're not really listening <laughs> or you're not really being listened to. And it's something we really have to train ourselves. One of the things that we rolled out in Valtech and where I roll out everywhere when I do is privilege awareness training for leadership. How does privilege manifest in processes, policies, decision making? Because these people are the visionaries and the decision makers of the company. And how do we change that process that's so ingrained for all of us? But I think when we decide actually who is worthy of listening to, we start to really deep delve into exclusion as well as inclusion. And that's what I want you to think about when you think about creating in inclusive marketing, inclusive products. My career at the start was developing as an engineer inclusive products for the public sector in the UK. So you won't have registered to vote in the UK, but if you did, that would be one of the systems that I helped lead to create to help people register all over the UK and anywhere else where that was relevant to them, but making sure it was accessible, that it was inclusive, that it made sense. Now I do the flip side of, I guess, creating the teams and the companies for those people to do that. Because I wasn't a very good software engineer, actually. There's people that are better at that than me, so I, I pivoted. And so I guess, what is inclusive marketing? And this is my perspective. Maybe you disagree with it. Hopefully, hopefully not too much. Um, but firstly, like I said, it's friction before decision making. When we make decisions that affect outside of, let's say, me, somebody else, and somebody else, what we're doing is we're having a privilege of putting something out into the world. We're having the privilege of potentially reaching or not reaching different people. Now what I ask people to do when it comes to friction before decision making is to start to proactively think, how do you make decisions right now? How do you decide I want to hire person X over person Y? How do I decide that's the angle for the story that I want to go to? You know, Andreas, you just mentioned that when you did the research for that last magazine, that actually it took you in a different direction. How did you decide to go in that different direction versus actually sticking with the tech trends? Which actually, when you mentioned AI and so on, that's really influenced by inclusion or exclusion when you look at the research. But what I want you to think about is how do you, as people, when you go back to your companies, bring these different ways in of slowing down, taking a second, taking a breath, we all move so, so fast. One of the things uh, my colleague at Valtech, Kenneth, always says is that we have to practice the principle of patience. And it is so hard sometimes for people to do that. I know it is because I'm trying to get Valtech to do it. And it's not always easy, but it's really, really important. Now, when we talk about perspectives that are not in the room, think about those statistics that I mentioned at the start. And there was only, that was only one five statistics, I think it was. What I would love for you to do after, when you go back to your rooms, when you go back to your company, is to think about who is represented in that room. What perspectives are actively heard and influencing the decision making that we're trying to slow down, but who isn't within that room? Now, maybe you don't have representation within your company. Okay, so there's a long-term fix there. But actually, how do you ensure you reach those perspectives now whilst you work on those longer term pieces. I always think about this in the way that I used to develop software. You know, you never rolled out a software solution without gathering requirements from the client, without user testing it, without doing user research, without creating user personas to make sure that actually, how does this map across different groups of people? How does it affect users with different impairments, for example, with different needs, different language needs, whatever that might be? Are we doing the same for our marketing approach? Or are we doing the same for our diversity and inclusion strategy, for example? And the answer for the second one I can certainly say is that most organizations don't do that for their diversity and inclusion strategy. In my book, I talk a lot about exclusionary inclusion, where we create an inclusion strategy that ultimately is created through our own personal experience and through the things that we really identify with. But what about everybody else? Do they not matter? 
like if I'm not disabled, for example, should I not care about creating an inclusive environment for disabled people? If I am white, for example, should I not care about embracing ethnic diversity? And that's what I want us to think about is bursting that bubble that I live in, you live in, everybody lives in at some stage or another, to actually really force yourself to seek those perspectives. I think, you know, social media has its um, ups and downs and its benefits and not so, whatever the opposite benefit is, my mind's on like. <laughs> but I think it's a really great way for you to start to reach, and certainly for me personally as well, reaching people that I would never have any experience with. When we think about bias, what I think is important is to think about how that's created. I know this, you know, this year's International Women's Day theme would break the bias, and we're still talking about it, and we should be. But if you think about how bias in your own heads, everybody's heads, is created, it's because of how you're raised, it's because of where you're raised, it's because of who you were socialized with, how you were looked after, what friends that you have, what friends you didn't have, who was around you in those formative years, and how that's influenced what you care or potentially care less about. And I, I identify with that a lot as someone, as a, you know, I was adopted at three weeks old, raised in Ireland by a white Irish family. There's no other people of colour around me except my brother who was also adopted at three weeks old until we were maybe 15, until we met other people of colour. And certainly the experience there is very different because actually when I look at, you know, the school photos you get, the big, huge school photos with everybody's faces, some people used to struggle to find their kid, but my parents didn't <laughs> because we glaringly stuck out. But that's a very different perspective then when I moved to a city, when I moved over to London and now down south of England and I travel the world doing this work, that actually the experiences that I have now are very different than the ones that I had in County Tyrone, which is a small, small county in the north of Ireland. Not of England, as some people might think. <laughs> <laughs> Reaching people of all backgrounds is slightly different than seeking perspectives, but arguably in the same vein. What I mean by that is, with the marketing that you create, with the solution that you create, the product, whatever it might be, how do you determine if it really resonates with different people? Do you listen to what happens after it goes out, or do you just kick it to the wild and hope for the best? Now, from software engineering, you would never do that. You support a product you listen to what the client needs repeatedly, you use Agile and go round and around in a circle. How do you make sure you do the same thing to determine if your marketing, your ads, whatever it is that you're creating, really does genuinely land, or does it miss a mark? And the only way you can do that is by proactively going to different communities, working with different groups, spending time understanding, actually, did this interest you? Is this something you wanted? I'm a board member at Women Who Code, which is the world's largest nonprofit globally dedicated to women in tech, where we run three monthly meetups for our 300,000 global members. And I started with that organization seven or eight years ago um, when I just graduated. <laughs> I'm much more fresh faced and less gray haired. <laughs> I dye my hair, that's why it's black. <laughs> but um, the key thing here is that. Um, what we did with that organization back then was 4,000 global members, mostly based in San Francisco. I took it across the UK, across EMEA, branched it, built remote teams, created partnerships and so on, and now it says a board member. But so many organizations now come to us when, okay, we don't have the perspectives internally. We don't have enough women in tech. We know we need to reach them. These are the things we're doing. But in the interim, can we partner with you to make sure we're getting those perspectives? Think about how you go outside of your four walls. You know, we live in a big, big world. Yes, there's borders imposed and everything else, but you have the ability to really learn outside of that. And then finally, I would love for us to challenge our own bias, both in ourselves and in our peer group. Um, bias is such a, a dangerous, dangerous thing. Some people think it's as simple as, oh, well, you know, it's not great, but it could be worse. But I really want you to think about those statistics, those exclusionary things that are happening. Think about the impact, again, I'm going to talk about COVID again, but the impact that has had on disproportionately on underrepresented people, whatever underrepresented means where you're from. I want you to think about why that is. It's because people that make decisions that affect thousands, millions, billions of people are biased, and they don't change it. And so I would love, whilst you're maybe not making decisions that influence billions of people, 
You maybe make decisions that influence yourself, or two people, or your family, or your friends, or your team, or your organization. And I think that's a really important point. And we mirror, we want to mirror, we want to represent all of the people and the societies that we serve. And that's what we do, we serve all of those different groups of people, especially in marketing. When you put something out there, that's for other people. And so I guess there's a few different, um, what's the word? I guess examples that I think are really good that I really like. So I remember watching this ad when it came out at the start, and I was at a conference where it was launched, and it was very, like, a whole new type of marketing. Think about the product that you have, and maybe you don't create product, but I want you to think if you were creating a product, how do you think about how it's used in the real world? Now in this example, we see Jeanette that creates razors and shaving foam and, and stuff like that. The video and the advert is through this, this guy who's transgender. His son um, has came out to him, is going through his transition, and is at the stage where he's starting to develop facial hair. And so his dad is starting to help him shave for the very first time. And the video is incredibly moving and incredibly eye-opening and a great example of thinking about who uses my product and who is being seen in the adverts right now. And I remember that ad coming out, and I remember like online everybody was incredibly excited. Another example is from Neutrogena with makeup remover wipes. Now you think of makeup remover wipes, I use them almost every day and everything else. But we've seen here when it was holy, which is a festival of colour, but you know, they have paint on you and you go down the streets and it's very bright and exciting. And for that festival they posted, you know, some of the hands covered in paint because they were at the festival where you throw paint and everything else and the makeup wipes to remove it. Thinking about the different ways people use your products and how you reach them. You know, think about the business benefits here as well. We're reaching people in a way that they haven't felt seen before. Another great example again is nail polish, where we've seen um, from JBN, which is a really famous character, um, and then the work that he does. Again, reaching a whole new brand of people, a whole new brand altogether, elevating your brand to take it outside of just this, this tiny box that many of us think in, myself included, and maybe just like dipping your toe just out of it, just a bit. And then again with Nike, with their marketing on when people were pregnant, actually how does their sportswear work? How does it move with this woman who's heavily pregnant and exercising and she's running in the video, she's doing all of these things, but she has the sportswear that moves with her. It embraces her, it doesn't force her into this different bubble that doesn't work for her body that's changing every day. And that's what I want us to think about, is actually all of this marketing, when you see it now, it's like, that makes sense. Why wouldn't you do that? But these were groundbreaking ads for those companies at the time. And so, I guess the best way to think about this is being proactive sorry, instead of reactive. And I've touched on these things as well, but I always think it's good to have, um, have a recap is listening. You know, all too often we, we speak more than we listen. I know, especially as someone in senior leadership, my job is to speak a lot, is to educate, is to provide vision, provide direction, provide strategy. Sometimes I should just shut up and be quiet though and listen. I understand the irony of that as I'm talking to you for half an hour straight. But listening is really, really important. One of the companies I worked at before Valtech, which is Pecan, which is an engagement platform, and I helped develop that as well as lead their inclusion and diversity internally, was listening at scale, creating a tool that allowed organizations to listen across the business, regardless of what region you're in, what time zone, whatever it might be, and then using those analytics to understand how do people X feel versus people Y about management support, diversity, belonging, all of those things. Always listen, always challenge what you're hearing. I think pivoting is really important. Um, I've been creating diversity and inclusion strategies for over 10 years, and I've always pivoted um, because I used Agile, and that came from being a software engineer. But so many companies certainly are changing, but so many companies create strategies that listen to the idea and are, okay, this is the problem we have. Okay, we're going to spend five to six months defining every part of that strategy, and then we'll roll it out in eight months' time. And by the time you roll it out, because you've used a waterfall model, for example, the problem isn't the same anymore. People don't live in a world that stays the same. The last two years have shown us that. The issues that have arisen in the pandemic around healthcare, around safety, around all of the different things that have happened, have shown us that you can't create something at point A 
I'm thinking several months, years, whatever, it's going to be the same. And so pivoting is really important. In Valtech, we have a three-year strategy, and I pivot on that strategy every two months. Every two months, when we roll out our surveys, I listen, I spend time with our d &I council that we've set up, I spend time with all of our managing directors in all of those 19 countries, it takes a lot of time. I spend time with all of our people and cultural leads, and then I pivot on that strategy, creating changes as we need to, changing things, how we measure stuff, and so on. Nothing stays the same for very long, so actually our approach should change as, change as well. It's almost like I wrote that to do that. <laughs> but what's key is that we spend that time that we change. I think it's always really good and it's well-intentioned that we say, that's not good enough. We don't always do something about the thing not being good enough. So that's a call to action to put that into practice. To actually make that change, to do more than just have awareness. In my book, I talk about the model I created on diversity and inclusion, which takes people from awareness to education to action and around again. Because the really big problem that we have in the world is that, and I think social media is probably one of the reasons for that, is that we, we spend so much time in awareness. This problem is horrible. This thing is really good. And then we lose our attention span very quickly. Sometimes we try to go from awareness straight into action. This problem isn't good, okay, what can I do to change it? But we don't go to education, we're actually, why? Why is that happening? Why are those unemployment rates that way? Who's making those decisions? What has happened in the last five, 10, 20, 15 years that has caused that? So instead of just going brashly to action, actually going from that awareness, okay, this is the way things are, this is why it's happening, and this is the history behind it, and then action, how do I change it? But change is obviously important here, because otherwise, people are talking to a brick wall. Nobody wants to waste energy. Passion is very finite, and yet somehow we expect people to continue to be excited to change things. But maybe we don't do the things that need to happen. Empathy, I think, is one of the biggest skills that I ask for when I'm hiring other leaders or I'm interviewing for people. And I think it's one of the biggest skills that anybody as a person can have, but yet, so many people seem to lack it. <laughs> you know, again, the last two years have probably shown us that. But I want you to think about how we empathize with people when we're creating something different. How do you push yourself into somebody else's shoes that might be completely different to you to really help reach them? And it's by doing these other things that we're able to do that. But what I want you to do is to not just assume that empathy happens. That it's something that actually we have to be specific about. Especially because things move so fast, people change, our minds move so quickly because we have so much to do. But actually really think about it deeply before we make decisions. And then finally, I would love for us to learn. Maybe you've learned something today, maybe you haven't, I don't know. Hope for the best. But what I think is really important that we really commit to learning. I have to learn things every day. I really work on changing and pushing myself on reaching those perspectives that I know I don't have. Because how could I honestly say that I can create things better, that I can leave them better than I find them if I only care about what directly affects me? And the answer is you can't do that. And so I think learning is important, committing to whether it's reading, whether it's articles, whatever it might be, to changing, to listening, to pivoting on what we found out, but ultimately working on leaving the world better than we found it. So I want to hear questions. Don't have me talk by myself for 30 minutes before I have to run um, and hear what you're thinking. Um, so yeah, I would love to go to questions. Thank you, thank you so much, Sheree. Uh, I fully support the idea of going straight to the questions because we only have uh, 15 minutes, and as I said before, we have to, uh, have to go to catch a plane in uh, 15 minutes. Um, so, if, of course, I always have questions, but I would like to open the floor for you. Are there any questions here in the room? Yes, already here? Yeah. I'll just come down with the microphone and then you can, uh, everyone can hear what you're saying. Thank you, I'm here. Um, we're James, we're always a little shy about the questions. No it's problem. A cultural <laughs> trait, sorry. Uh, uh, what, what, I, what I got from you very much was the idea that if we do not think in these ways, we lose out on so many human perspectives, which actually makes us poorer. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so I, I, I really like the idea that we are opening ourselves to 
the richness of including other people's perspectives to own. Is that wrong? No, understand? that's exactly it. <laughs> Which means you were listening, so I like it. Um, I think that it's really important that we, we recognize that um, echo chambers really fuel how we reach people because we're drawn to people similar to us or slightly adjacent to us. And then that means that we create things that those people resonate with, but there's so many other groups of people that maybe are not being considered as well. And I think when we when we push ourselves, we have the ability to reach people that maybe have been continually excluded, um, but also widening our own perspective, which I always think is a useful thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to get that perspective. Thank you very Good. much. Good, Good. perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, was it? I just wanted to say that uh, the example with the Gillette pet, I thought that was a perfect example of what you were trying to explain to us. Uh, how do you add something uh, multi-dimensional to something as intrinsically boring and one-dimensional as shaping? Yes. I thought that was perfect. I, I could stop smiling afterwards. <laughs> oh great, thank you, thank you. I love that advert. I think it's, and P&G have done a number of adverts like that, but that one was always, I remember seeing it launch for the first time. Um, I think it made a lot of difference to the trans community as well to really take the scene. For something as boring as shaving, yeah, don't think shaving is exciting for the most part. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dora speaking. Thanks for a great presentation, it's super interesting. Um, a very operational question here. Um, I think it's super hard when we try and do um, uh, communications and, and materials that really resonate in, in, in an empathic way to make sure that it doesn't look like something um, like a checklist, mm -hmm. like someone is trying to get like a, a bingo. So I think it's really hard to find the right um, balance on, on striking something that is truly authentic and actually not um, downgrading a little bit by trying to uh, you know, get all the diversity yeah. bingo out there. So um, how do we... Um, how do we truly empath empathize and get the right balance in actually creating something that is authentic around this theme? I think that is really difficult. I think for me, the, the real part of authenticity is the ability to admit when you get something wrong. And that's where that listening piece comes from, because if we push things out into the wild and they miss the mark, and then we continue to do that, we haven't learned from that, then it's not authentic. If you put something out that is genuinely what you think is the best thing because you've listened, and if it still misses the mark, the key thing is being able to publicly or openly say what has not quite met that standard. We have had a, you know, it happens in companies all the time. It happens when you share diversity and inclusion data, for example, that is really, really poor, but you're sharing it with the goal of changing it in the long term, mid term, whatever it is. I think what's also key is that we don't rush um, when we put things out. Um, when it comes to something feeling tokenized or a checklist and so on. It's because we're doing it very quickly for with that thing in mind. But actually when we spend the time analyzing it, when we spend the time listening to the groups that it affects before it's cut out, then we have a much lower chance of it being inauthentic because actually it's been created directly with those people that we're talking about, as opposed to just telling them that this is what they need and hoping that they take it with open arms. I have an example if I may. Yeah. Um, so we had a campaign for uh, installers at some point uh, in Germany, and we did a quite heavy research figuring out how do we get the right um, diversity in here because uh, like 99% of the actual people being installers in Germany are men, and we wanted to do something that they really identified with and felt came from their world basically, that we were uh, understanding their world uh, as a brand. So we decided, upon much thinking, to not bring in female um, installers into the mix of uh, photographs and materials and so forth, because when we discussed that topic also with the, with the audience, with the, all of the men, they felt that we were pushing our opinion uh, down into their world and thought it was quite um, um, a little offensive for us to take our values and try to say this is how we think our brand thinks that your industry and your work life should look like. So we did that and we launched the campaign and then uh, we actually got an, an email from a female installer feeling super left out. And we were like, damn, <laughs> how do we balance this? Um, do you, would, what is your take on that situation like this? I would, personally, I probably would never have created something that didn't have a number of different genders. Represented. You, I, I'm really sorry, I don't know if it's a Danish word, it's the word, what's the 
the word that you're saying? It's female, you said female something? Uh, What's that? Oh, installers. Oh, okay. I'm to do it. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's fine. Um, what I think is um, important is the balance that sometimes we go so far in the other direction that actually then we're leaving out the people that are still there. And so in, in that example, for me, I would have only ever put something out that was balanced as opposed to skewed heavily in either direction. Um, and I think that's the key thing here. There's nuance existing. Um, one group doesn't always exist and the other one doesn't always exist. There's two here in this instance. Um, but actually, even though some that are represented less or not, that doesn't mean the other group isn't still there. And that's when we talk about inclusion, we're talking about inclusion of everybody, majority demographics and underrepresented people. So the balance when you tip it like that, somebody's going to be pissed off. <laughs> okay. So I think it's always about, even if the balance is this way, is bringing it more close to this as opposed to completely the other direction. Oh, thanks. Thank you. And I know Pierre will, will say something more about this when he, uh, when he gets yeah. first. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. I think what we're discussing here at Kayak and Rwanda is very much that you can push it as a process to be more inclusive and to remember that you have a blind spot and so forth. Um, but I think we also have a big discussion on whether you should put in fixed rules. Mm -hmm. Should you make sure to always, when you hire new people, always ensure a certain percentage of yes. minorities and so forth. I just wonder what is your take on that? Yes. <laughs> I, think, How do you do it? <laughs> I think what's, what's really important is recognizing that um, good intentions are intentions. And a lot of the time, intentions don't move to action. And the problem with that is that, and we went through it before there, um, what happens is that people raise problems, raise issues, you say that's horrible, we're going to make it better. But then you get to like, things get stressful, things get busy in work, and there's nothing holding you account to keeping that promise. Because a promise is a promise, but actually how do you measure a promise? You don't is the answer. And that's where numbers are really, really important. One of the things that we're piloting in Valtech at the minute is we know across our across the, the company as a whole, in junior mid-tier grades, the balance for women and men, for example, and when we only have binary data at the moment, isn't or is broadly the same, it's broadly good, but when you move up into senior roles, it's not. Um, we know, for example, VP, director and above and so on, the balance is not good enough. We know it's not good enough. What we are doing in EMEA, piloting it, because it's one of our biggest regions, is actually before we commit to hiring new senior people, that we commit to interviewing a number of people from underrepresented groups, depending on what underrepresented means from the region we're looking at, before we commit to hire. Because actually what's tending to happen is we're hiring within our networks. Most of the people that are doing the hiring are middle-aged white men. Their networks are the same, and they openly admit that. But what we need to do is push the, the, the talent we're looking at is here, but there's all of these people outside here. And so by committing to, before we make that decision, that we will have at least interviewed X number of people from other backgrounds, then we start to hold ourselves to a thing that actually we can measure. And we're already seeing it make differences. You know, I'm involved in all of our senior hiring now to make sure that we are actively talking about this as well. You know, I don't want to hire, let's say, a new VP who doesn't care about diversity and inclusion. Because how can you be a VP in a global company with the growth acceptance that we have in mind and not care about diversity and inclusion? You can't do it. So we wouldn't hire that person. So it's about putting checks and balances in place. In the same way you would define a business strategy and check if it works, you should be doing the same thing with your inclusion and diversity strategy. Thank you. We, uh, we have another question here. Hi there. Um, Eva. Um, so I have a personal interest within diversity and inclusion and I'm working in a like international company. So I have like two two part question. The first part is I'm not a decision maker, but how could I as an employee nudge the management and the, the leadership team to, to make the change? Uh, and the second part is that we are looking into different occasions, we want to celebrate, for example, pride, which is something a lot of people want to communicate. And my question to the team was that, do we even know like how many people do we represent and how are they actually feeling within the company? So would you, if we are going to begin this diversity, inclusion, uh, sustainability, you know, implementation, like, would you do like a survey figuring out how are we actually doing, how are people actually feeling, do they feel included, um, yeah? So I'll answer it separately. Um, so the, the first question, I think what's 
important is recognizing that you're probably not the only person that's interested in making things better and being involved in diversity and inclusion. I always think it's important for employees that maybe don't sit at decision making tables to collectively bring that voice together, whether that's within a, a volunteer council, whether that's within something that then you can bring to leadership together. I always think that people are usually more comfortable doing that because you're not the only person having to be that voice. If you would rather do it alone, and maybe you will, I would suggest that you find someone in leadership that does have the decision making ability and is interested in this um, to help them bring that message with that to the rest of the leadership team that maybe don't get it so much. And that's an assumption as well that they don't get it, they all might get it. But I think it's key to figure out what it is that you want and make that as opposed to just kind of flagrantly saying something as opposed to having something specific. I know from being in leadership and working with leadership all the time, need to know information is the best kind of information to bring me because I can make a decision on it. If you bring me something that's so fluffy and takes me so long to digest, I might not get to it. So again, think about it in that way. And then the second question around with this um, celebrating pride. Um, you should ask people what they want. Um, you should have, if you have a town hall or a company-wide event or even at a team level, ask people, are you interested in celebrating this? The key thing though is also making sure that you do this in a psychologically safe way. Not everybody is going to be comfortable to say, yes, I want to celebrate pride. So in the first instance, start small, whether it's a small celebration that you have internally, or people can come along and then you decide actually, is this a big enough thing that we want to create a community group around it and so on. But test the water first. Once you get to that stage of creating, I guess, that trust, that's when I would start to look at how you formalize it, you know, when people do want to share their, whether they're a member of that community or not, but never start off with that because what you have to build this trust with people feeling like actually, yes, there's a pride event happening on Wednesday at lunchtime, I'm going to go along and see what it's like and then go from there. Um, try not to rush it even though sometimes it's really easy to want to just rush ahead. Um, but the listening part is really core with that, especially because of how difficult things can be for that community. Great. I just had a follow-up question for that. I think it's, uh, when we talk about diversity and inclusion, I think it's hard to avoid completely the debate about uh, rainbow washing or mm -hmm. any kinds of washing, insert a word before washing. Um, could you maybe share your thoughts about that? Because that can also be a very uh, practical challenge. I think maybe touch a little bit upon what you mentioned before. Uh, if, if we have dilemmas mm -hmm. uh, where you really want to do the right thing, you want to do something, but maybe you're not prepared as a company to go all the way, so maybe you only go 20% of the way, and then you end up having, uh, we had a conversion in Denmark recently, which was very controversial, it turned out, uh, where you had um, business leaders wearing high heels. I've seen that one. Yes, you've seen it, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, and it, it, it started a real debate, because the debate was about um, how can you sit there with your high heels as a, as a middle-aged white man leading a company where you have none, but only a few women in the board. So could you maybe share your thoughts about uh, how we avoid uh, different kinds of washing yeah. when doing inclusive marketing? Yeah, um, I think the, the key thing with washing, you know, whether it's like green washing for sustainability or pink washing when you're talking about LGBT plus folks and so on, is that um, you're not being accountable for what you're actually doing. You're only going so far because you think it's what people want to hear. And I would argue you should just not do anything until you're willing to go that full way. It's not really good enough to do the bare minimum and think that people are going to pat you on the back now, especially because we live, I think, in a, in a society that's, and it's a positive thing that people now feel more comfortable saying, why are you doing that? You know, why are you stereotyping people and thinking that that's going to be received well? The key thing actually, whenever, and that, that ad campaign you're talking about is a good example, is that to prove and to ensure that you're not washing or being tokenistic, is they should listen to the feedback that they're getting now, and maybe they have, I don't know, and they should also spend time addressing it publicly. This is why we made this decision. We understand that this is the mistakes that have happened. This is what we're going to do to change it. And that's when we change it from being tokenistic because we are account we listen, we're accountable for what's happened, and then we change. Um, and I, I, I get that. I seen, I seen that campaign, and I didn't quite get what the stereotyping was and how that was supposed to be positive. I get it from one hand, but on the other hand, does it add anything? And the answer is that for a lot of people, it didn't add something, it didn't change something. And I think that's what, what needs to happen when those things happen, and then will happen. People will make mistakes, is to be really transparent about what you're going to do about it next. 
Thank you. We have two minutes until Cherie has to leave, <laughs> running out for the airport. Is there a final question in the room? Otherwise, I have a final one. Uh, <laughs> but I want to give the opportunity to someone here. No? All right, all right. My final question is, uh, it's good and fine that big companies can do these things, but where should people start? The people in this room who want to go out, they come back, they're busy, they have a lot of meetings, uh, you know, back to the everyday drill. Where should we start if we actually want to start this process in the companies where each of, of, uh, of these people in the audience are working? Yeah, um, I think regardless of the company size that you're at, you can always start. I think that the first thing that you should do before you create anything is start to delve into why do you care about this in your company first. Why does embracing diversity, that representation piece matter? And what does fostering inclusion actually mean? Take it separately, post round tables with your company, talk about it at your town halls, have your senior leadership delve into it, make sure that you host sessions with people that aren't just in leadership roles to figure out actually what's the why behind this, what's the value for your people and why do they care. Take that away, like you would take away a discovery phase, and then analyse actually what can we do about that. The first thing that people always do though is they overcommit. They're like, okay, we find that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine things are not good. This is what we're going to do to change it. Don't do that. If you on if you unearth, let's say, ten things are not so good, talk about those ten things, share that back to the company because they've shared that with you. But commit to doing one or two things per business quarter or whatever timeline that makes sense for you. And then do those things really, really well. It's very easy to overstretch because we really want to make things better. But then we end up doing nothing and we almost get paralyzed because we don't move because the time spreads so thin. Pick one or two things and really smash it. It might even be that you just do one or two things a year because you're starting out. But the key thing on that journey is don't only talk about it when you're finished it or when you think you're finished it. Talk about it whether it's every month, every quarter, whatever it is, to the entire company so everyone's involved. So again, at Valtech, we have a very clear com comms plan for DNI. I host a company-wide update every month of an exciting initiative that's happening. Every quarter, I host an internal town hall or a Q&A session with myself and Jakob, who's our chief delivery officer, who's the executive sponsor for this work. Every six months, I do an internal report, and then this year, at the end of this year, we've committed that this is the first time we're going to do an external diversity and inclusion report. That's the full everything, the whole shebang. But again, we've committed to that, and we do that all throughout the year. So think about what makes sense for you, and go for it. Bye, my Thank you. Thank you very much, Sheree. Let's all give a round of applause.